Vince, we are will. you ready for rapid fire? Let's do it. We're going a little bit earlier well, than usual, but thanks to Hall of Famer Muffet McGrath for jumping on with us to start. You know, it's funny. You, we were talking about the fact you're going to have Muffet on and everything, and I was like, well, you know, I'll just hang in the wings and, you know, listen and all that, and you're like, it'll go fast. She's very straight to the point. <laughs> you're right. Her answers are succinct. And they are to the point, and they are fantastic. Yes, but there's no extra verbiage. There's yes, there. that's right. You don't you don't get any. There's no there's no gristle on the, no on that bone. No, you're gonna you get have the to be, answer, but you're you not going to get a lot that goes along with it. That's right. You have to be properly prepared as an interviewer for that type of an interview. Like that, I think that's what people don't understand is you have to know who you're interviewing really to properly prepare. Like there's some people. You got five questions, that's an hour show. And you got some people, you got five questions, that's four and a half minutes. You know, like right. you better you better come prepared for be ready that, to go. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> that's good stuff though. It was a really good interview. It's almost rapid fire itself. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Seriously. I think I have a little bit, maybe not of what you had well a couple weeks ago. Probably not I'm that sorry. bad, but I've got a little in the chest right now yeah. so i have gave to make sure and pause and hit the mute button every now and then so gave it to you through the airwaves right all right so notre dame alums drew tranquil and aaron banks will mm. represent notre dame in the super bowl for the chiefs and the 49ers respectively scale of one to ten how much does having a couple irish alums in the game affect your viewing experience like a two and a half three like I i'll be paying attention to them obviously but, you know, one's an offensive lineman, so it's a little bit more complicated to watch. I, I mean, you're forced to know where Drew Tranquil is because he played a heck of a game this past weekend. I was going to say, he, he might have been everywhere. the best player. I mean, the Chiefs had some you know, good defensively. He might have been. Oh, you can make a case for Drew yeah. Tranquil as the best, de at least defensive player on the field. I know a lot of Notre Dame people were talking about Cal Hamilton. but Who played exceptionally well, player. too. Yeah, he did. With the exception they, of the touchdown pass that he gave up. But that wasn't bad coverage. Like, no, that was a perfect pass. That's a Hall of Fame quarterback yeah. and a Hall of Fame tight end making a play, you know? On a hall, on a future Hall of Fame safety. So, I mean, that that was that was really good coverage. It's just he put it in the one spot that that there's nothing that Kyle Hamilton could do, right? I mean, yeah. it was – but I thought that uh, those two, Kyle Hamilton and Drew Tranquil, were the two best defensive players on the football field in this game there there's no doubt about it and look we've all watched Drew tranquil since what 2014 2015 whatever it was i mean it's been it's been a minute um that's just how he is man that's how he plays he overcomes whatever odds i i can safely say i didn't know drew tranquil was a starter for the kansas city chiefs i knew that he oh, signed really? okay. with them i knew he you know but he led them in tackles he had over 100 tackles i believe yeah and he was all over the football field. I he played so well. I mean, it's if you would have told me, <laughs> excuse me, if you'd have told me in 2012 when we faced off against his high school team in the playoffs that he was going to be a starter in the Super Bowl, I'd have told you you were crazy. There, there's no, <clears throat> excuse me, there's no way I would have predicted that that would have been the case. And he's an easy kid to root for, man. He's Jesse was texting me for. yesterday because of course, Jesse played in that game that you're talking about in the sectional championship that Adams lost to Fort Wayne Carroll that oh. Tranquil and his brother played for. But I Jesse said oh. it kind of makes stomaching that game a little bit easier. Now seeing Drew Tranquil in the Super Bowl, right? With Kansas city chiefs, you know, I mean, you're not wrong. I mean, he single-handedly beat our team. I mean, he yeah. did. He single-handedly beat our team. Now, there are some terrible coaching decisions on our side, but he single-handedly did. Like he had a pick six, and he—I mean, he did. I, I would love to go back and actually watch that film uh, one of these days to just watch how that game played out. But he was a one-man wrecking crew and did some amazing things. And now he's doing it at the pro level, which, again, never would have guessed that would have been the case. But he's doing it, and like I said, as a Notre Dame fan. He's an easy kid to root for. He's very easy to root for. Yeah, and I think that, you know, I know Brent won't like this, but the fact that I'll be pulling for the Chiefs against the 49ers definitely makes it easier to pull for as well. You know, like in terms of, 
you know, the viewing experience, I, you know, I, I think I'm kind of in line with what you said. I'd put it at a three or a four in terms of how it affects it. There have obviously been other Notre Dame guys before, but like the fact that Drew Tranquil is so good and he'll be playing for the team yeah. that I'll be pulling for. That's true. Helps. Like, you know, Aaron Banks, great. Uh, you know, I said last week, I think the only time I was going to pull for the 49ers was in that Green Bay game a couple of weeks ago. They won that game. We can, you know, I can put that behind like Aaron Banks. You hardly even notice because he's an offensive right. lineman. Exactly. What shocked me about Aaron Banks when I looked him up today, he's only 26 years old. The man is still only 26 wow. years old. And amazing. Man, I know. I know. So it's kind of cool, you know, like there's so many other things that go on in the Super Bowl that, you know, like, OK, <laughs> so John is John is going to go with the uh, I hate Taylor Swift. So he's pulling for the 49ers. All right. I know I mean, you're not alone in that. I don't understand it, but, I, you know, I know, I know like, why that should have any to, thing to do with who you're rooting for. But right. Like, like, did you see, you know, like she like every time she's in those suites, she tries to stand at the back of the suite yeah. now, and it didn't look like the one that she was in was very big. True. It's like, you know, they did the thing where you could read her lips. She's she's like, go away, you know, like leave me alone or whatever it was. Like she doesn't want the attention, but because she's there, the TVs get keep giving her attention. You know, she's the girlfriend or the, you know, whatever you want to call it, of the, uh, you know, one of the probably 10 most famous active players in the NFL yeah. right oh, now. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, like, is she not supposed to go to the games, you know, just to appease viewers so that the TV cameras don't Can't show find her? her. Like, yeah. What exactly is she supposed to do about that? Like, it's how not, is she it's supposed not her to fault. control that? I, right. I, I'm not convinced the, 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 you know, the relationship just happened. Just seems all very whatever. But, like, I don't know. It doesn't bother me as much as it bothers other people. You know what I mean? Right. Like it just, it seemed convenient that like the second they started dating, all of a sudden he also had all of these sponsorships and these commercials. Like those don't just happen overnight. And then all of a sudden here they are. Like that seemed <laughs> awfully convenient, but whatever. I mean, it is what it is. Well, I mean, uh, he has played in a, in a few Super Bowls the last few. No years. doubt. So, it mean, just seemed was, very convenient. He was gaining more of those. The timing you know? was very convenient. That's all I'll say. <laughs> but Every time he scores a touchdown or does something amazing, they show her. There's okay. The yeah. Like people get really pissed off about that. I'm like, it's a three, it's three seconds. It's okay. They showed Brock Purdy's parents. You know, they like, it's not like I've said before that I get annoyed with the constant cuts to any family member in the stands. Yeah, that's fair. For enough. reaction. They do that with everybody, but sure. you notice it more because it's Taylor Swift. Where did you, where, do, how many times did we have to see? Jason and, and you know, Kelsey's mom, right? Mama Kelsey. Yeah. Right. She's on the today show. She's gets cut. She was the one getting cut to before. Right. I guess I'd rather see Taylor Swift. With if I've got to make a decision. And, yeah. I'll, I'll take her. If they're going to cut to somebody. <laughs> That's a good point. Actually. That's so, a good point. You know, I, I'm not a fan of Taylor Swift's music, but that's because I don't listen to music all that often. And so, does, it just doesn't matter. I don't – hey, more eyeballs on the NFL, that's great. I, I think I saw a number that her being at these games have have, have equaled like $350 million worth of advertising for the NFL. Yeah. I wonder what it's going to do her. for the – I wonder what it's going to do for the Super Bowl because they're oh. talking – you know, they're already talking, like, is this going to be, you know, a record Super Bowl viewership and all that kind of stuff because you – know, and I realize there are conspiracy theories and all that kind of stuff. We don't have to go down those rabbit holes. But. Right. It's it's uh it's gonna be really interesting because you know because there's talk that you know like with the the whole Swifties thing that you could get like a, as much as like a five million viewership boost. Oh yeah, you know, just just off that's the real. Fact that she's involved. Yeah, it's that's a hundred. It's a hundred percent real. I don't understand it. I don't understand why she's so incredibly popular. That part boggles my mind, frankly. But it is what it is, and it doesn't take away from the game that's being played on the field. It's like they're showing her instead of showing the game being played. Right. So I, it, it, it's what like my favorite is, Oh, maybe she'll make a guest appearance in the halftime show. It's like, it, this isn't like high school where they just have random things at halftime. <laughs> like they've been planning this halftime those are planned, show for those months. Are planned for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Like she's not just going to dip down and just 
take over the halftime show. Come on now. Come on. Well, it, I'm sure you've heard about the whole thing. She's got a concert in Japan the right. night before. So now she's got to figure out, you know, like the flight to get to Vegas and and all that kind of good stuff. And so. she'll get back the day before, it sounds like. I, I, I've seen the itinerary, right? Right. And everybody's like, well, I don't know if she'll be able to get on the plane. She's not flying commercial people. No. Like, she'll be on a private plane. She'll make it back the night before. Get well, a good night apparently sleep. her concert is mm-hmm. like 7 p.m. in Japan, which is like 5 a.m. Vegas time. You know, this is Saturday. So she's got plenty of time yeah. to get there. Plenty, plenty of time. Because it's like it's happening in the future, kind of. Because right. of the time zones and all this. She's going to make up time. Line and, yeah. yeah. She's going to make up time coming back. So she's got plenty of time. It's not like she's going to get there at kickoff. Yeah. And there's going to be like a Taylor spring watch. forward, fall back. She'll gain all kinds of time. <clears throat> exactly. Come <laughs> on. She'll be fine. She'll be fine. And she's got billions of dollars to make it happen. Pay so for that plane. That's she'll right. be good. So Vince, a local high school student mm-hmm. named Jerry Barca from St. Joseph High School here in town designed some custom shoes for the Notre Dame men's basketball team that they wore Saturday. Head coach Micah Shrewsbury's shoes said, building culture. So my question if you had custom mm-hmm. shoes, what would you have put on your shoes? See, if I, 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 the way I did this is I put myself, well, no pun intended, in the shoes of a player uh-huh. at Notre Dame. Okay. Okay. And so I would want like Shamrock on there. I'd want the, the Irishman on there. I would want the Golden Dome. Like I would want all the Notre Dame stuff and like uh, almost look like graffiti or something like on the shoes. You know what I mean? Like I want the Notre Dame flair on the shoes. That's what I would have done if I was Makes one sense. of the players. You know what I mean? Just Makes like sense. it'd be so Notre Dame like overload. That's kind of that's kind of the line that I was thinking as well because these were custom made for Notre Dame players. So I, you know, like I would get like like instead of like your swooshes or your shoe logos, you know, like on the sides of the shoes, you know, like a Nike swoosh or your Adidas stripes or right. whatever they like, get a couple of shamrocks in there. But then I would tie it like I was thinking, you know, like, you know, you know again, Shrewsbury had a saying and some of the other guys had like, you know, like his says building culture. I would I would tie it in to my favorite sitcom of all time Seinfeld oh, and, you know and I have to go with a Costanza <clears throat> quote in it okay like in the shamrock it would say do the opposite because <laughs> so, of every instinct that I have is wrong the opposite would have to be right so do the opposite I like it you have it you got a, that's your personal quote I like that that's right I, I'd have to come up with something you know I'd have like rule number 76 Play like a champ, you know. No excuses. Play oh, like, like a champion. That. No excuses. Play like a champion. Yeah, yeah. put that one on there. Yeah, yep. that would be great. Yep, I like that. <clears throat> Chris says that you would have Michigan sucks. Maybe we could have like an upside could... down block M. You know, like <laughs> the horns down thing, but it's Michigan down. Oh, I almost put it something up that somebody. Never mind. So at Saturday's BYU-Texas basketball game, students in the front row of the BYU student section had shirts that spelled out horns down, but they were asked to remove those shirts by their own school during the first media timeout. Fair or foul? A thousand percent foul. That is ridiculous. There is nothing offensive about horns down. That is not, it's not a slur. It's not anything of that nature. It is making fun of their logo or their little hand gesture. The the fact, the fact that they fell into that and they're like, no, you got to take it off. That is so soft and so just terrible. I, I, I was appalled when I saw that. I was. I was. I was like, too. That's what the student section is supposed to be. I know. We, we've seen documentaries about student sections and how they do research on the players to yell at them and things like that. But you can't put a shirt on that says horns down. Absolutely terrible. Terrible. It's ridiculous. I saw one of the sports writers, you know, retweeted it over the weekend. And he was like, is horns down hate crime now? Like, yeah. Like, 
what is going on? Like how how has Horns Down become this thing? Right. That has, you know has become this this great divider. You know, like we're like Texas is so touched by this whole thing that we can't even talk about horns down now. You know, oh you know, again, gosh. like they want to throw their horns up at you. If they want to walk around doing right. their horns up, then anyone else should be able to mock them doing a horns down. It shouldn't 100%. be that big a thing. Hundred percent, and that's not even that bad. Yeah, I, I mean, has anybody sat near a student section before? And, even in know, high and school, again, the students weren't even doing the hand gesture. They just like it was like however many would it like 10, 12, you know, 10, 11 students each with a t-shirt, you know, with with the letter with one letter on the front spelling out horns down. Right. Like, it's actually fairly creative when you think, and it's not even that creative. It's just like no, like it's it's a known thing. You're offended, you're triggered by this, Texas. And then your own school, BYU's own school, their own admin, you know, whoever that's, and that's made this terrible. decision. That's what's stupid. Like, come on. I if if the Texas people came over to them and were like, hey, you gotta you gotta stop them from doing I've been like, uh, no, we don't. I, I mean, how about you stand up for yourself? I can't I, even think of another school where like <clears throat> anything like this has built these kind of legs, you know. Oh, nothing to this not nothing of this magnitude because it's it's college athletics. It's athletics in general. This is, it, it's not even offensive. Like if it was something that was actually offensive, if they were making some sort of a hand gesture that was actually offensive, then okay, fine. But like, that's not even the case. Right. You're not, that, that, that's exactly right. Even, even doing a horns down, it's not an offensive gesture. It's just two fingers down. It means nothing to general yeah. society. It's like no. it's specific only to this one school, this yeah. one school only, and that's and it. I just don't under like Texas Texans. People in Texas are supposed to be these big, tough. Everything's bigger in Texas thing. Well, apparently your feelings are bigger than everybody else too, <laughs> because the fact that you're offended by horns down is. One of the most ridiculous, softest things I've ever heard of in the land of athletics. It's it's terrible. Absolutely right. terrible. And it's even worse that BYU is perpetuating that and, and feeding into it. Oh, well, we're sorry. We didn't mean to hurt your feelings. We'll make sure they take their shirts off. Like, come on. <sighs> DK says, stop saying no to lame. <laughs> and I mean, it's not even... Like Notre Lame is not even inventive, but I would say that that is harsher than horns down. Like I, my feelings should be more hurt if you're calling it Notre Lame than horns down. And and if Notre Dame people True. said that hurts their feelings, and that's ridiculous too. I agree <clears throat> because uh, it's all me. it's it's all in the spirit of fun and rivalries right. and everything else, right? <clears throat> Isn't that kind of like yeah. You're not you're not using any profanities. You're not you know crossing any right any, any of those kind of lines. I, I I don't understand how it's become what it's become. It's ridiculous. This this, this one made me mad. Like this one this one touched me off. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm I'm a little ticked off about this because I love a good student section razzing the other. Yeah, team. I think this I, is actually great student <clears throat> section activity. You know, yes! like I said, creative. Yes, doing something like this. Right. Great right. use of time in, in the student section Com uh, coming up with something like this. David makes a great point. So a quarterback can wear F Notre Dame on his fingernails and not have to take those off, but you can't say horns down. Like I would say what Caleb Williams did to Notre Dame was, I understand what David offensive. is talking about, but if the cameras hadn't zoomed in, you know, like, fair enough, but like, I that's way more offensive. That's right. way oh, more. Absolutely. Offensive. It's you know absolutely I mean? more offensive. So it's like, that's right. Yeah. It, terrible just right. ridiculous it would be a different thing if caleb williams you know wore f notre dame you know on a t-shirt <laughs> and fair you know, enough like, did what george kittle did when he did the you know like to the cowboys or but and that now that i think about it george kittle you know he got fined for wearing that shirt and pulling his jersey oh, yeah, up yeah that's right when they were playing the cowboys yeah earlier this year so that's right even in the nfl just oh that's so soft so vince brent has been hanging out in here 
Uh, a lot of people obviously watched yesterday's championship games. Which loss was worse, the Lions or the Ravens? It's definitely the Lions. I mean, they they, they had that game in absolute control, and they just, I mean, peed it away, for, for lack of a better <laughs> term. They, they, <clears throat> they were dominating in the first half, just absolutely dominating in the first half, and they just let it all just go away. I... I it's it's hundred percent the Lions. Like they, the way they played that first half and the way they played the second half, the third quarter specifically, was just night and day difference, and it was embarrassing to watch. It's it's absolutely the Lions. We'll get to the uh, to the calls, the decisions here in uh, in just a minute. John says Ravens. Blowing a big lead is definitely bad. I'll make the case for the Ravens just because. They went into that game as, like, they had 11 wins over teams with winning records this season. They were the number one team in the AFC. They got to host this game, obviously. And as soon as, like, it was a 7-7 seven to seven game early on. And, you know, the, the Chiefs had a lead at halftime. It was, what, a 10-point game yep. at halftime? How... Ravens running backs ran the ball five times. They got off their game so quickly. Yeah. Like they panicked as soon as they didn't have the lead. It wasn't like, you know, it was a 10-point game. They acted like it was a three-touchdown game for most of the game with, you know, Lamar Jackson throwing the and ball he was, all over the place. He was off yeah. all day. All day. And they were running through the 49ers. I'm, excuse me. They were running through the Chiefs' defense like a hot knife through butter to start the game off. And then yeah. they just went away from it. I think, I think I, I heard like three carries by their running backs for 17 yards early, which is over five yards per carry, yeah. obviously. And then they only had two more carries the rest of the game. Like that's, that's not what the Ravens want to do. And the fact that they just completely abandoned their running game when they were down by 10 points and they were getting stops against the chiefs as well. It just, it made zero sense to me right. the way that they went about it. And, you know, and I think that when you look at them versus the Lions as well, like going forward, I think I think they will have a harder time being back in the place that they were in yesterday, number one seed hosting an AFC championship game versus the Lions. Like I think that as young as the Lions are, still a lot more upside for them. You oh, know, yeah. like the core of that group is going to stay together. Whereas like the Ravens, you know, like Joe Burrow was out this year. You're going to have to face Joe Burrow twice next year. Sure. You still got Patrick Mahomes hanging around. You got the Dolphins coming. Like it's I think it's going to be a lot tougher in the, yeah. in the future for the Ravens. So like between the fact that they just completely panicked as soon as they faced a little bit of a deficit and what they've got going forward, I'll just make the case for them. But I don't I don't totally disagree. Obviously blowing a lead the way the Lions did was brutal as well. well. It's horrible. It is the, the and I, I think I said this on the board. Uh, the worst part about the Lions losing was on social media. They're all like patting each other on the back and, you know, hugging each other and crying. And like, at least Michigan won the national championship. <laughs> we still got Michigan. You still yeah. got Michigan. I'm like, oh, uh, for now. For now you do. Mm -hmm. We'll see how that plays out. Mm -hmm. So Greg Olson, who was doing the game for Fox yesterday, said he had no problem with Dan Campbell's decisions to go for it rather than kick field goals on fourth down and those two fourth and short opportunities that he had. That's how they got there, is what Olsen said. Do you buy or sell it, Vince? I will sell it. I understand why he said it, okay? I do. I get why he said it. I mean, that live by the sword, die by the sword. I mean, that's been Campbell's mantra the entire way. Like I get it, but you're in the NFC championship game on the road. You need all the points that you can get. Yep. And so I don't know that it necessarily lost them the game because there's other decisions that were made throughout the game that they could have prevented the 49ers from scoring other I mean, decisions and, and a lot of drop balls, like second and half, absolutely. all of a sudden they couldn't hold on yes. to, they were making plays everywhere in the first half, right? Second half, all of a sudden their guys can't hold on. To the no ball. football game comes down to one call like that. That's, that's, that's a ridiculous premise in the first place. Now we can all circle back and be like, well, if he'd have kicked a field goal here, then obviously they would have had more points, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. 
that's absolutely accurate, right? But if they if they get those fourth downs, Dan Campbell's a genius for going forward on fourth down, right? And so I just think in this particular scenario, NFC Championship on the road, you got to get points where you can get points. Yeah. I, I think I think that's the most important thing here. I understand that Campbell is a is a is a gambler and all that, and that's his mo. And I, I get all of that. I do. I just in this case, man, you got to go get the points, man. You got to get the points. Yeah, you had a chance to keep it a three possession game, and you, you obviously needed that three points at the end of the game the way it played out. And like for people defending Campbell's decisions, you know, the, like you said, live by the sword, die by the sword, or whatever. Well, at the end of the first half, when they kicked the field goal. That went against his whole, you know, we go for it on fourth down too because it was right. fourth and short in that situation. Yeah. And, you know, like all these numbers that I've seen thrown out, that actually, that decision actually decreased their odds of winning more than the other two decisions that he made, you know, not to kick the field goal. So, like, nobody, nobody's talking about that just because they got a few points out of it. But I, I agree, you can't coach this game like it's week six of the regular season. You still have to have a feel for the game, the way the game is going. You've got to, you've got, I think, especially the first one, you've got to at least give your team a chance to have a three possession lead. You know, I, I probably even have a bigger problem though, with how he managed the last couple of minutes when they're down by 10 at that point, you know, again, if you, if you, try to kick one of those field goals and you get one of those field goals, you're not down by 10 and it, it changes the whole complexion of the end of the game. But I felt like he, the, the, you're, you're down by two scores. You right. needed to take four, you know, like four or three cracks at the end zone. Once you get, you know, down around the 20 yard line, save your timeouts. If you don't get, you know, a touchdown on one of those three tries, you kick the field goal and then you kick off. You've got your timeouts. You can use the, you timeouts can get the ball to back the clock. That's exactly right. So they they just used way too much yeah. time, and then they tried to run the ball, you know, and right. they had to use one of those timeouts, which again goes against, you know, what whatever the numbers are telling yeah. them. That was not a good decision in that right. case. So there no, were just absolutely a lot of micro decisions. But look, it's the first time Detroit's been in that <clears throat> situation in three decades. It's the first time Dan Campbell's ever been right in that situation. You know, you there is an argument that they are there because of the way, you know, his mentality, oh, absolutely. the way. He coaches, but I do feel like as a coach, you have to have a better feel for the way the game is and you right. need points. You know, it can't just all be like, it's one thing to make that decision. Like I said, in week, week six or seven of the regular season, but when the playoffs, I mean, you get to the postseason, you have to change your, your, your thinking. I think. I agree. I completely points. agree. You points. have to have points. Points, points are the matter. absolute most important thing. Points, points, points. That that's, that's what you need. That's what you need. Um, so what did you think about our boy Olsen? I, I, I heard a lot of criticism come his way for uh, how things went down in that game. I don't know. Really? Did you notice anything? Because I, I didn't really notice. Uh, I had somebody text me saying he was terrible, you know, or whatever. I don't I don't I just don't notice these things. I was wondering if you did. We're talking about Greg Olson, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I didn't. I feel like Greg Olson, I think, is really sharp. He's really good. I think he does a really good job of, you know, quickly explaining what just happened. And, you know, a lot of times the the meaning, you know, or the the why behind what just happened. He does it very concisely, very quickly. And, you know, and um, you know, people are able to understand him, I think. I think Greg Olson is really good. Yeah, um, I didn't it, I didn't I, he didn't bother me. So Now, you know, my guy to... Romo gets bashed a whole lot more. I felt like Romo when I was watching that, you know, there were a couple times where he still did some of his little Romoisms and stuff like that, but I actually felt like he was like he went into that game with a sort of a a different uh, you know, mental state of mind in terms of you know, preparation, sort of like he knew that Kyle, he knew like that when Kelsey scored that touchdown that Hamilton had not given up a touchdown to a yeah. tight end all season, for example. Yeah. You know, so like yeah. some little things like that there, you know, again, he's sort of a feel of the game kind of guy. So he strays from time to time. But I felt like Romo 
had a pretty solid game compared to some of the stuff I've seen from him during the regular season this year. Right. Yeah. No, I, I thought that, uh, I, I thought that he, that, that Romo was more like the original Romo than, yeah. the, than the caricature Romo, um, that he's kind of become. Does that make sense? Like yeah. He, he just seemed I, it more felt like It felt like maybe CBS said, Hey, you might want to, le- you know, maybe we lean into this a little bit more, you right. know, like, like, not the complete, you know, predictions and stuff like that, like he did those first couple of years, but it, it felt like he was kind of going in that direction right. a little bit more yesterday. Right. Yep, I agree. But I also read some stuff today that like saying that um it was somebody in the in the industry saying he doesn't he he thinks that Nance and Romo like don't really like each other, that Nance doesn't want to be there with Romo anymore, all Ooh. this different kind of stuff, trouble in so. paradise huh i know we'll see aren't they, aren't they doing the super bowl they are <laughs> okay guess we'll see how I that know. goes fair or foul patrick mahomes and travis kelsey throwing ravens kicker justin tucker's helmet and kicking tee because tucker was set up where mahomes was warming up warming up before the game yesterday and it's totally foul okay look I am all good with like goofing around and like whatever, but they kept doing it over and over and over again. Like I've, I've been to a couple NFL games and I've, I purposely got there early so we could watch the kickers warm up. Right. And because I have a kicker and we went to an NFL game together. Right. And so he wanted to watch them warm up. Cool. That it is a common practice that you warm up on both sides of the field as a kicker to get used to the wind and, and everything like, and it's totally but he wasn't normal. warming up. He was just sitting there stretching in the middle of Mahomes doing his warm-ups. But himself. then he set up his ball, and they kept kicking it out of the way. Did you see the rest of the video? He set up his ball. He set up his ball at the two-yard line. What is he kicking like? That's how you do it. You start. Goals? You start with one steps. You start with no steps. One steps. Two steps. Three steps. That's how you progress when you're warming up. And you you don't kick no steps from like the fifty. You do it from like the goal line. Don't you think he could be at the other end of the field where maybe the rest of his team is instead of where the Chiefs quarterback? Uh, he was out be? there first, and then the Chiefs came out. He's a so, kicker. He doesn't matter. Vince. Oh, He's whoa, a whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Come on now. Come on now. <laughs> Look, like I said, I'm all about goofing around and like, you know, silly, ha-ha, fun, fun. But they kept it up longer than it needed to be. It, that, that's all, that's what I'll say. It's too much. It's too much. I I th- I think that 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 I, I think it was totally fair that Kelsey and Mahomes did what they did because you know again it's like he was stretching. From what I saw, he wasn't even kicking. He was just sitting there stretching and had his little you know stand to whatever you call that thing you know like set up there you know in his helmet you know, sitting in the middle of the field. And it's like, come on, dude. Do you really he have was to literally be lined up for a kick and Mahomes went over and kicked the ball out of the way. See, now that I didn't see. That's all, messed all up. I, all I saw was his little T and his helmet. You know, that's what that's when that's when Kelsey came by and he like threw everything off. Like, okay, ha ha ha. That's pretty funny. You know, whatever. And then he like walked away. Okay, cool. Like that's that's fine. But like Mahomes kept walking over and kicking the ball out. He would set up the ball. He would step it off like he was going to kick it, and Mahomes would walk over and kick the ball out of the way. Like that, come on, dude! Like, what are you doing? You know, right. I, I, that that was that was over the line for me. Like that part of it. But Justin Tucker didn't seem to mind. He was laughing about it. So maybe you know, maybe we're getting all work. Maybe I'm getting all worked up for no reason. But just felt like it was a little much. That is the thing. <laughs> it's like I haven't seen any response from Tucker to yeah. all of this. He's Maybe the highest paid kicker in the NFL. Nobody has to talk to the kicker. Yeah. So. He's the highest paid kicker in the NFL. He doesn't care. He's off singing opera. And and that that could be a little bit of why he was there though too, because he is basically a celebrity kicker, you know, slash opera singer. And it's like feels like he uh he has a little bit, you know, maybe more elevated opinion of himself than your that's, average yeah. kicker. Yeah, that's so. definitely well. I can tell you from being around many kickers, they all have elevated opinions of themselves. I think they kind of have to. I agree they? with you. But I like, think the nature of the position. The mental. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. You have to. You have to think like that because you are treated like a second class citizen right. at practice and for warmups, for that matter. Like you are tre- like 
in, unless you have multiple football fields to work with, you don't ever get to kick on the football field during practice. Like you're like at the high school, they kick on the track, you know what I mean? Or they find a tuft of grass, you know, to kick on that has nothing to do with a football field. You know what I mean? So it's like, you're, you're, you're used to being treated like crap. So maybe that's why Tucker didn't care. Cause he's used to being treated like that. I don't know, but it was, it was funny to a point, And then it got ridiculous to me. Right. David asks, if since I'm an announcer, do I watch sports paying attention to the announcers more than others do? He says he's a former offensive lineman, so he watches the offensive line more than others do. That's fair. And, you know, I have found, like, speaking of, like, if we're going to tie in the announcers and offensive line, in a Romo game, there is very little attention paid to line play. Like, if you've ever noticed that, like, yeah, I don't know if you've ever, yeah, yeah. It, which is, you know, it's it's all, you know, basically about the quarterback right. and, you know, getting oh, yeah. a lot of intangibles. 100%. Um, I wouldn't say that I always necessarily pay attention more than others do. The biggest thing for me that I want from announcers is not to annoy me. <laughs> you, <laughs> That's you know, fair. Like, like what, what annoys most people about announcers, I think, is they, you know, perceive bias and stuff like that. What I want from, what I want from the biggest, you know, like, the Joe Buck, Troy Aikman, you know, those kind of guys is just to feel like when I'm tuning in, it feels like it's a big game feel when it's supposed to be a big game feel. Um, now, I will, I, I guess I'm trying to figure out how to say this. Like, again, mm -hmm. I, I just, I don't want to be annoyed by announcers. Yeah, and right. that's what, you know, like right. redundancies, when you hear things that they're getting wrong, yes. you know, those kind of things. Yes. That's that's when I, you know, yeah, get fair. peeved off by announcers. That's and, fair. And there are obviously guys who you can tell who have been, you know, putting more time into it, more effort into it than others. Yes. Well. I, I think that I think you hit the nail on the head. It, it's guys that aren't prepared that annoy me. Yeah. And you can tell when guys aren't prepared. You you just can. The the mispronunciation of names, you know, not understanding where a guy plays you know, making wild, not accusations, but like, you know, you're trying to analyze something and you're completely off because you clearly don't know how this kid normally plays. Right. You know, that kind of a thing. Like lack of preparation, I think annoys me the most. And uh, other than that, if you're, if you're prepared, it's hard to be terrible as like an analyst. Right. You know, there are plenty of people whose cadence isn't good for like play by play or whatever, but if you're prepared, you can overcome a lot of some of those technical difficulties, if you will, right? Um, so I'm with you. It annoys the crap out of me when when announcers mispronounce names and clearly don't know who they're talking about. Yeah, it, it, it's just like they pick somebody up off the street and like we got to go talk about this game. Right? That that does annoy me a little bit. I, I want a little bit of research done, you know, a little bit, especially if it's your job. You right. know, like you can exactly. give some high school guys a little bit of you know, leeway or some, well, you know, that kind of a deal. But like when you're getting paid to do it, you better, and especially football where you have a week to prepare, you have a whole week to figure this out. That a week to prepare and a lot of resources because they Absolutely. get the production meetings, you know, access to, you know, all different kinds of information and, and all that yeah. stuff. But yeah, the repeating of like the, like, I like Gus Johnson. I do. But like the Maserati Marv thing got <laughs> old really fast. You know, because he just kept repeating the same thing over and over. Like that's a that's a thing you go to the well for one time, right? You go you go to that well one time, ha ha ha, move on. You know that kind of a thing. Like that 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 annoyed me in that particular game. Brent says so. Is Buck and Aikman the standard for announcers? I think so. I personally I think I think that they are the number one booth, and I don't think that it's. You know what? I'll, I'll tell you this. Burkhart and Olsen, who are, you know, who replaced Buck and Aikman as Fox's number one crew. I think that they were like Burkhart took some getting used to in year one, I think, last year, just because, you know, basically you'd heard Buck's name, you know, forever, you know, right. calling those games. But I feel like that I feel like in year two, it had a, you know, a much different feel and i think that you know that that booth was elevated olsen helps that of course being as good as he is sure. as quick as he is but i i feel like for sure 
Buck, Buck and Aikman are number one. And, you know, like Jesse and I were talking about awful announcing does this uh, survey of, of, uh, you know, viewers like NFL fans every year oh. they, and they rank the announcing crews. Buck and Aikman came in number one. And I think Romo Nance, they were like sixth or seventh or wow. something like that. They were pretty low, wow. pretty low. They have wow. fallen over the last few years. Hmm. I, I think it's very premature to put Tom Brady in the number one seat, but I also understand that they're paying him exorbitant amount of money and that's what you do. But like, Demoting Olsen for Tom Brady, who has zero, you know, experience doing this, I think is a real gamble. Yeah. Remember, though, Romo had zero experience when he jumped in that first year and he skyrocketed. You but know, was he was he in the number one chair like immediately? Yeah, they threw was it, he? Okay. He went right to Jim Nance. Oh, okay. At number one. And it was All like, right. really? You're gonna put him in there? I guess I guess Brady has been doing like he's been. He's been practicing. He's been watching. The reason he wanted this year off, I, I don't know how much actual practice. I, I know he's – I've read that he's done some practice. I don't know who he's practiced with. Okay. He's done some of that, but he's watching everybody, you know, like the entire league and, you know, trying to – you know, because as a player, obviously, you're mostly focused on your team, you know, sure. looking at the defense you're playing every week. So I guess he's you know spent a lot of time – this year doing a lot of uh doing a lot of leg work getting ready for next year which wouldn't surprise me based on his reputation as a hard worker and you know yeah. all of those different things so we'll see how it goes we shall see how it goes i i just want i want to hate tom brady so i you know <laughs> I, I want to but he'll probably be great at it so there i just go. wonder like do you keep olsen in that booth do you make it a three man booth right away Ooh. Like I, three man booths are awkward sometimes too if it's not done correctly. They can be, you know. Yeah, I don't know. It can be done well. It can be done well, but there has to be a good relationship there, you know. I think that uh, if, like, depending on what they do with Olson, like if he does end up getting demoted to the number two booth, I don't know what his contract is like, but I would think that someone like Amazon for those Thursday games would come after him because yeah. he's I think he's much more worthy of of some of those you know like the standalone national type games than being the number yeah. two guy uh, agreed yeah agreed what did you think of Gus Saturday night I you know what I would listen to you I'm sorry oh I really had you, I had you on I had you keyed up and uh my daughter and I were watching the game listening to the dulcet sounds of, of Sean Styers <laughs> so yeah yeah, I, I just, I, I, I should have listened to Gus Johnson. I actually forgot that he was doing it, if I'm being honest. But like when I watched the women's games specifically, the people that are doing the women's games are not good, just because I do feel like they're not getting the preparation that they should for some of these games. There's been a couple of games where they haven't even been at the game; they've done it remotely. Yeah, they're and, still doing some of that, and that's frustrating to me. Like, it, it, you know, we're well past the time where you should be doing it remotely when you're calling a game, you should be there. And so I just don't like listening to the women's basketball commentators. I would much rather listen to somebody that knows the team. And that's you. There are, I appreciate that. There are a lot of, a lot of young and inexperienced, uh, yeah. doing some of those TV broadcasts, I think. True. Still and it's just, there's a couple of people that they just pull out of mothballs too, that <laughs> I don't even know who they are. But like, and I don't recognize them. But they're older. Like, must be retired from whatever they were doing. Um, I don't know. It's just so how much. How much time does it take you to sync up the the radio broadcast to the TV broadcast when you're doing that? Um, if, at least a few possessions. Uh, <laughs> you know, because I got internet TV usually. Now this time it was on Fox, so it was the the spread was much wider. Oh, really? Uh, you know, because the Air Channel comes in immediately, and then the Odyssey app obviously is online, so that's even more delayed. So I, I had to put on – I had to change it from Fox on the air to Fox on the stream so I could pause it and then sync it up. Does that make sense? Gotcha. So, yeah. Gotcha. It, it takes a little bit of time, but once you get it, man, man, it's great. Ready it's to great. go. Right. I haven't done that in forever. I used to do that in college all the time when we yeah. would 
turn down the sound of the TV and listen to the radio guys. Yes. Yes. That's when I kind of became addicted to to the play by play stuff. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that's going to do it for tonight. Relatively quick show. I guess we've been here for an hour. Thanks again to Muffet McGraw for jumping in with us, though. DK says, I can't believe Vince is complimentary to Sean after Sean threw kickers, kickers in the dumpster. Well, you know. Because I'm a nice guy. I'm, I'm a forgiving human, okay? That's right. I'm very forgiving. That's right. <laughs> All right, well, that's going to do it for tonight. TD4ND, thank you. And, and again, thanks thanks again to, to Muffet for coming on talking about the, uh, the UConn game. We'll be on tomorrow, of course, and we'll have some more Notre Dame football talk on tomorrow's show. So we're looking forward to that. Join us then on Ivy Nation Sports Talk.